Good afternoon and welcome to today's Astronomical Colloquium. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Jim Stone from uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton to give a talk about how to model accretion onto black holes, which is, I think, highly timely in the light of the image all of us have been seeing in abundance in the past weeks and so on. So, before we go into the talk, let me say a few words about uh, Jim Stone. Many of you, at least certainly those who work in computation astrophysics, know him because he's the author of two, or co-author of two of the very prominent workhorses we all use in, um, in computation astrophysics. One is uh, SUS, and um, SUS is a bit outdated, I would say, for many applications, I shouldn't say that. And the, um, the really new thing that he has been working on and developing for the past decade or maybe 15 years or so is Athena, and the latest version is Athena++, which can do many, many things that we are all dreaming of with our standard codes. Um, and I'm sure we will get a glimpse of what this code can be doing when applied to uh, this application. So, despite his prominence in this field, let me say a few words about um, his, you know, how he came to be there. He started in uh, Kingston, Ontario. Uh, he got his uh, bachelor and master from Queen's University there. Then he moved just south to the University of Illinois where he was working at the National Supercomputing Center with, um, with Mike Norman. So he finished uh, his PhD there in 1990. And then he moved to the University of Maryland, <coughs> where he became a professor of astronomy in 2001. He then spent a interim time as professor of mathematical physics uh, at the University of Cambridge. That was in 2002 and 2003. And then he came back to uh, the US, where he went to the Princeton Institute for Computer Science and Engineering first, and then to Princeton University to the Department of um, Astrophysical Sciences. And he was chair and uh, Lyman Spitzer, junior professor for theoretical astrophysics from 2016 to 19. And since June or July 1st, 2019, he moved a bit further out to the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, and he's now professor at this institution. So I will now um, close, and let's welcome again Jim and look forward to learn about how black holes accrete. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be, uh, to be back in Heidelberg again, as though the first time I visited the university, previously been here for meetings or other, other events. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, there's so much astronomy going on here with so many institutes. It's been a very busy couple of days catching up with people, but I've really enjoyed it. I think Heidelberg must be one of the centers for astrophysics in Europe, given the activity going on here. So it's been really, really enjoyable. Uh, they warned me the uh, lecture hall was very steep. The uh, chairs are uncomfortable. It is steep. I'm getting a little uh, motion sickness here, looking way back up here. Uh, to, in fact, the youngest member I've ever seen attend one of my colloquia. Uh, must be only what, a year and a half, so that's fun. Uh, uh, there we go. <laughs> I'll try to keep it simple so that everyone can understand it. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some recent work we've been doing on black hole accretion flows. Uh, this, to be clear, is work I've done with uh, a, a large number of collaborators, including some very, very good students and postdocs who have been at Princeton. So for example, Shane Davis was a postdoc, Kyle Falker was a student in the Applied Math program, Yan Fei Zhang and Chris White were also both students, and Kengo Tamita uh, is now a professor in uh, Osaka University and was a postdoc at Princeton. So they've all contributed very, very significantly this work. And I'm going to try to explain to you the image that's on the background here, which is a snapshot of a time-dependent black hole accretion flow in which the radiation field is very dominant and contributing significantly to the dynamics. 
Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if I'm going too fast, or if you have questions, I would be happy to answer questions as we go along. So let me start with the motivation of why we want to study this problem. Let me tell you a little bit about the numerical methods. Indeed, as Ralph said, the, these calculations can only be enabled using numerical techniques, and I should at least tell you what we're doing there. I'll briefly tell you a little bit about what's been done previously and then move on to the, the new results we have on fully global models of accretion flows in this regime. So, of course, the simplest motivation for why study these flows is because they're so important in astrophysics. All of the most luminous sources in the universe are powered by accretion, and accretion onto compact objects like black holes is a much more efficient way to release energy than, say, nuclear fusion, which is what powers most stars. So things like quasars uh, are powered by accretion onto supermassive black holes, or X-ray binaries is powered by accretion onto stellar mass black holes. Um, so if we want to understand these sources and we want to understand their evolution and the evolution of black holes in the universe, how they grow from seeds in the early universe into the supermassive objects we see today, we need to understand these accretion processes which can, can significantly change their mass over time. There are two modes of accretion, I think, that most astrophysicists talk about today. One is a radiation-dominated mode, where the plasma is very dense, uh, fully collisional, so that you can treat it like a continuum, so you can treat it like a fluid. Um, you can use the equations of magnetohydrodynamics to describe it in this regime. There, strong radiation is very important. The energy density in the photons greatly exceeds the energy density in the, in the thermal particles, and so mod modeling the radiation is absolutely crucial. And in this regime are quasars and X-ray binaries in their so-called soft high state. A very different regime is the so-called low luminosity uh, uh, accretion flows. Those are powered by very, very diffuse plasma, so in that case, the mean free path of the particles in the plasma may be comparable to the size of the event horizon of the black hole at the center. So this very uh, weakly collisional, nearly collisionless, you need to include kinetic effects in the plasma. You may need to even treat it as a completely collisionless plasma in that regime. Because there's so few collisions, there's very little radiation generated, so there's very inefficient cooling. And objects like the galactic center and M87 uh, nearby supermassive black hole and an external galaxy are in this regime. So luminosities, uh, for those astronomers who know Eddington units, so luminosities are 10 to the minus 5, Eddington are smaller. Um, so I'm really going to be talking about this radiation-dominated regime today and not so much about the luminosity. Now, unfortunately, the Event Horizon Telescope, which recently reported such a beautiful image, was for M87, and so it's in this low luminosity phase. I'm not really going to say anything about the image taken of M87. I'm going to be fo focusing more on the physics in this, in this uh, high luminosity phase. And there's a bunch of motivating questions from the observational side as well. Um, so for example, uh, a recent satellite mission called New Star, an X-ray telescope, has identified so-called ultra-luminous X-ray sources, ULXs, as being accreting neutron stars, meaning that their luminosity is much bigger than Eddington. Again, I'll define this Eddington and Edward luminosity in just a minute, but basically it's the highest luminosity that a spherical accretion flow could have. Um, so nonetheless, we observe these flows at higher than that luminosity. How is that possible? This was truly a breakthrough because previously it was thought that these sources were much more massive black holes and therefore their luminosity was not super Eddington. But the discovery that they're actually neutron stars unambiguously shows that many of these sources are creating at super Eddington. And so just how does that happen? How can you create matter when the radiation force is exceeding the force of gravity? Secondly, uh, we know from spectra uh, that disks do not just have a thermal spectrum everywhere, that in fact they have this very significant contribution from non-thermal radiation uh, elsewhere in the flow. So for example, the spectrum of a classic accreting stellar mass black holes, the so-called Cygnus X1 source in our own galaxy, shows this nice thermal radiation bump marked by the blue uh, curve there. That's just the accretion disk itself, the, the, the dense part of the disk. But in addition, there's a component at high energies, which is sort of a power law tail at high energies, due to very, very hot plasma thought to be in a corona. Again, in sort of analogy to the sun, which has this very hot plasma, million degree plasma above its surface, 
somehow the accretion disk is forming extremely hot plasma above the midplane and generating this mixed spectrum of accretion disk plus corona and also reflection of the coronal photons off the disk itself is very important. So how does that work? How do accretion disks form corona? This is already a complicated question for the sun. Is this the same mechanism that works in accretion disks as heats the solar corona? Uh, we'd like to understand that. And then finally, you know, these spectral modeling is extremely important because if we want to measure the actual properties of black holes, we can never really observe them directly. All we see is the plasma that they're accreting. We see the plasma as it's falling into the black hole. And therefore, we need to understand what produces the photons there very accurately so we can take a theoretical model of the infalling spectrum of the, or the spectrum of the infalling plasma and extract things like the properties of the black hole, its mass, its spin, and other things. And this requires a very, very accurate sort of prediction for what the spectrum for an accreting black hole should look like. Right now, our predictions, I would say, are not so necessarily accurate. They're based on so-called alpha disk models uh, with a very simple model for the continuum. We'd like to try to improve that. Can we do better uh, and be able to predict these spectra from first principles in order to be able to use the spectra of a accreting black hole to measure directly things like spin, mass, and other properties? So those are some of the motivating questions that we're, we're trying to address. So suppose we want to study this problem. We want to study theoretically accretion on the black holes. What do we need? The first thing we have to remember is that accretion itself is being driven by magnetohydrodynamic processes, in particular the so-called magnetorotational instability, the MRI. So a magnetized plasma that's in orbit around a central object and has a background shear profile, like Keplerian, a rotationally supported Keplerian flow, is known to be linearly unstable to small amplitude perturbations uh, in MHD. And those small amplitude perturbations grow into turbulence. Uh, and this is known for now 20 years through nonlinear MHD simulations of the growth and saturation of the MRI. So this movie shows an example of taking a small little patch of a much larger accretion disk, simulating the MHD or solving the MHD equations in that small little patch, and watching the MHD modes emerge. So let me just sort of play it again one more time here. What you're watching are the angular velocity fluctuations in the background flow. So initially there's zero, everything is Keplerian. And then you see the linear modes of the MRI pop out from small amplitude perturbations, and then it transitions into turbulence. And this turbulence has a large Maxwell stress associated with it, and that stress transports angular momentum outwards. And so the MRI is now recognized to be the mechanism that transports angular momentum outwards and allows matter to accrete inwards in fully ionized in plasmas, like uh, the accretion flows around black holes. So there's been a you know, huge amount of work, and I you could give a whole conference on what we understand about the MRI today. But the point here is that if you're going to study black hole accretion flows, you need to include MHD or you're not going to capture the most basic dynamics, which is what drives accretion in the first place. So the very first thing you need to at least include uh, is a magnetohydrodynamical model, at least in the high accretion rates where it's really an MHD model and you don't have to do collisionless plasma physics. So that's the first thing you need to include. Of course, the other thing is radiation, and the reason why is because of this so-called Eddington limit, or at least that's one way to understand why. So what is the Eddington limit? So that's the limit when the, for a perfectly spherically symmetric radial accretion flow, it's the limit where the radiation force on electrons, due to photons scattering off electrons, when that outward push of the radiation field is equal to the inward pull of gravity. So for pure Thomson scattering off of free electrons, then it's straightforward to calculate the radiation force, luminosity times cross-section. And of course, the gravitational force, you can just use the Newtonian limit and the far field limit from the black hole. And you set those two things equal to each other and you calculate a limit on the luminosity, so-called uh, Eddington luminosity. Any higher luminosity than that, then the radiation force will exceed gravity and you should be blowing a wind. You should be producing an outflow and not an inflow. Now, of course, this is only for spherically symmetric flow. And so the answer is going to be uh, in you know, multi-dimensions, you might be able to break this. But for spherically symmetric flow, the basic 
sort of scaling here is there's a special luminosity, the Eddington luminosity. And when the flows are at or near the Eddington luminosity, you clearly need to include the radiation forces or you're not going to get the dynamics correct because the radiation forces are completely dominant or can be dominant. And so we're in that regime in studying these sources. Ultraluminous X-ray sources are well above this limit. So we know we need to include these radiation forces. Okay, so now we think we know the mathematical model that we need to solve. Uh, it's the equations of hydrodynamics, compressible fluid dynamics. So those are the black terms and equations. Um, continuity equation expressing conservation of mass. Additional momentum and energy equations expressing conservation of momentum and energy. And then in addition, you need to add in the induction equation to evolve the magnetic field, pointing flux and the energy equation and uh, uh, Lorentz forces and the momentum equation to account for MHD processes. So the black and blue together gives you MHD, ideal MHD, and the limit the plasma is fully ionized. And then finally, you need to solve the rate of transfer equation for the specific intensity at each frequency and each angle in the flow everywhere, uh, including the absorption and emission processes, absorption, emission, and scattering processes. And then, given this radiation field, you can then calculate the net heating and cooling rate in the energy equation due to the interaction of photons and matter, and also the net force on the, uh, the matter, this, this uh, vector g in the momentum equation. Uh, again, that's the net you know, exchange or momentum between the photons and the matter, which comes directly from taking angular quadratures of the radiation field uh, and the flux uh, in order to calculate those forces directly. So this is the basic mathematical description of a fully ionized plasma, including the effect of radiation fields, and that's what we need to solve. Simple, uh, straightforward, at least the equations, they look simple. Of course, they're a complicated coupled system of hyperbolic PDEs. Uh, they're very expensive to solve in, in multi-dimensions, but fortunately, you know, over the last 20 years, we've developed numerical algorithms now that have become reliable enough to be able to solve these equations directly. What's new is the radiation field. This adds a tremendous amount of complexity. It's a highly high dimensional object, and so solving this equation is a bit challenging. I'll say a bit more about that. But I would just make the point that, in fact, if you think this is difficult, I think it's actually very simple in the sense that we think this is a complete description of the physics. We think this is a complete mathematical model to understand black hole accretion flows. There's no missing subgrid physics. There's no missing processes that are not represented in this mathematical model. So for example, in cosmology, you might need to include star formation feedback or AGN feedback at very small scales to study galaxy formation evolution. We don't quite know how to do that, so we have subgrid models None of that exists in this issue. There are no subgrid models required. And if we can just solve these equations accurately, we should be able to learn about black hole accretion flows. And if we can't model existing flows, that'll tell us something very fundamental about their physics that'll teach us something very, very important. And yes? Sorry, this N here? That, that's the direction vector. So that the transport of radiation occurs only when there's a gradient along each direction, you know, if, if you like. So it's a directional vector. It's a unit vector on each dimension. Right. So I certainly apologize. I know I'm flashing up equations, and if you haven't seen them before, this is going to be complicated. But I want to make two points. One is that they're, you know, hopefully by inspection you see they're time derivative plus divergence of something equals uh, a right-hand side, so they're all hyperbolic conservation laws. And then secondly, they are a compl complete system that, you know, we, we hope if we solve these equations, there's, there's nothing more that we need to do here. And so I would argue that we're actually in a simpler circumstance than many of our colleagues studying other problems in astrophysics. So, uh, it's my, that's my optimistic view. Uh, so we're using, uh, you know, new methods we've been working on, as, as Ralph mentioned, uh, a code called Athena++. Uh, Surprise, surprise, it's a rewrite of a code into C++, uh, uh, the so-called Athena code, which was developed uh, about 15 years ago. So rather than trying to modify it to include radiation and other techniques that we needed for modern HPC stems, it was much easier just to start from scratch and rewrite the code from scratch than trying to port the code to, say, modern architectures. It uses the so-called staggered mesh constrained transport algorithm for MHD. This is very important for keeping the divergence of B0. 
another of Maxwell's equations we must satisfy. It's not an evolutionary equation, but it's, of course, fundamental to the physics. So this algorithm guarantees that you keep div v0 to machine precision. We're using adaptive and static mesh refinement, curvilinear coordinates. We have GR, although what I'm showing you today will not be in full GR yet. We have this full transport radiation, that MHD, that I'll describe in a little more detail, and various other bells and whistles that help make these calculations possible. And the, the things that are really important for today's talk are the MHD algorithms, because that's crucial for doing plasma dynamics. The adaptive mesh refinement is crucial for being able to do large dynamic range in space. And the curvilinear coordinates is crucial. Finally, the uh, radiation transport is absolutely crucial. So for example, let me just give you some, some sort of uh, uh, more details in some of these features. So for example, the mesh that we choose is generically a curvilinear spherical polar mesh. It's ideally suited for an accretion geometry flow around a compact object. But in addition, we use this mesh refinement to resolve small scales at the midplane, where we know the accretion flow is densest, where the disk will form. And so we can have very small cells towards the midplane to be able to resolve turbulence there, and much larger cells towards the pole, where essentially there's no plasma. Plasma is excluded by an angular momentum barrier and never really gets to the poles, so you really don't need a very, very fine mesh there. And so in order to concentrate your computational effort in the regions you need it, you can use these adaptive meshes. And that's a very standard and very powerful technique used in astrophysics and other kinds of fluid dynamics. For the radiation transport algorithm, there's various approximations that many people have adopted over the years. And our approach has been to just to try to solve the equations ab initio. So we, in this particular project, and for the results I'll show today, we solve the time-dependent transport equation directly, using basically finite volume methods like the way, same way we solve all the other PDEs in the problem. It's challenging because the specific intensity, this, this I object, uh, at the top bullet there, is a function not only of position, but also two angles to describe the intensity of radiation in all different directions at each point in space, uh, as well as frequency and time. Now, in principle, well, in practice, what we're doing is integrating over frequency and only solving for the continuum radiation field. So at these temperatures, the opacities are basically just scattering opacity, gray opacities. And so we can just choose one frequency bin. That gets rid of one dimension. But we're still left with a six-dimensional PDE that we have to solve, which is two times or two more dimensions than the other equations, if you like, because we have all these angular bins. And that means we need you know, every single spatial grid point on the mesh. We need 100 angles to represent the spatial or sort of the angular uh, uh, variation of the radiation field. And, and so that's, that's a lot of memory, in principle, a lot of calculating. 100 times, sounds like it's 100 times more expensive to evolve 100 times more variables per cell. In fact, it's not because the transfer equation is actually very simple compared to the MHD equations. And so the number of actual floating point operations you need to update the transfer equation is probably 10 times smaller per variable than it for the MHD equation. So we can get away with many, many more angles than we do the other conserved quantities per cell just because solving the transfer equation is a lot cheaper. And modern computers now are really very, very impressive, I'm sure you all know, and so it's really quite cost feasible just to simply solve the transfer equation ab initio directly and not make any approximation about how you solve the equations. But we're solving the time-dependent transport equation, which means we're limited by the light crossing time, so it really only works well for relativistic problems where the flow speed is comparable to or at least closer to the speed of light. Uh, and there's a frequency-dependent version that we're working on. The cost, the total cost of the algorithm is just simply the number of angular bins times the number of frequency bins. Right now we're using one, but we can always, you know, uh, adjust those two numbers any way we want. So we could do some frequency-dependent transport at the cost of lower angular resolution if we, if we chose. And as computers get faster and bigger, inevitably we're going to be able to use much, much larger values here. Yes? Also scale with the number of uh, resolution elements. Uh, like it's not linear in number of gas cells, right? It, it, it actually is because these are all explicit. I mean, uh, I mean, so the total cost of the algorithm is the number of cells, t you know, times these uh, t these factors here. Yes, right. So, but that's. I mean, that's actually very good. It's an order n method, uh, which is probably best you can do. Uh, so, so not so bad. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so, so why do we go to such expense? This, this, this brute force kind of approach seems crazy, but in fact, for our applications, we know for a fact that it could be very important. So for example, we've tried testing more approximate methods, so so-called flux-limited diffusion, where basically you just solve a diffusion equation everywhere rather than solving the transfer equation, and you modify the coefficient of diffusion to try to account for optically thin regions and optically thick regions. Uh, or the so-called M1 method, which does one level of, of, of complexity higher than that. I won't get into the details, this is more for the expert. But if we just do a simple test problem, where we have a flat plate uh, of some fixed temperature distribution irradiating free space above it. So it's just emitting photons into free space above it. And you ask, what does the radiation field look like in this region above this flat plate? This is a relevant problem for us because this is our accretion disk and in the middle is a black hole, and we're trying to calculate the radiation forces above the accretion disks. So we want to know what the radiation field above the disk is. Well, uh, you can see that these three methods, so VET is very much like what we're doing now. It's a direct solution of the transfer equation. You can see that VET, M1, and FLD give you very different answers for this problem. And moreover, you can compute the solution analytically. You can just calculate, uh, you can just integrate the transfer equation along every line of sight. Uh, and that's this comparison here. So the the solid lines are the contours of the radiation energy density computed analytically, and the dashed lines are the VET solution. So it's the VET solution that's correct. And the other ones, M1 is significantly overestimating the radiation forces in the vertical direction. And that could be problematic for the flows that we're looking at. And FLD is just too diffusive. It's filling in the corners, although to be honest, it does better than M1 in this particular application, if you, depending on how you, what metric you have. So our, my point is that there's true differences between these methods, and figuring out what works and what's important is really very important here. And so, because we're not smart enough to know whether or not M1 and FLD is good enough, we're just going to do the safe thing, which is solve the ab initio equation, or solve the equation ab initio, and not, and not have to worry about whether our approximations are working or not. How else do we know these methods are working? Well, we can couple the radiation to the fluid dynamics. Unfortunately, there's very few analytic solutions for the full equations of radiation hydrodynamics. One set of solutions are given by small amplitude linear perturbation, so linear wave, the dispersion relation for linear waves in radiation hydro. That can be computed analytically. So such waves have a phase velocity, propagation speed, and also a damping rate. So they, these waves damp because of either diffusion of radiation out of the, out of the uh, wavelength or because of cooling. Uh, and so you can solve that analytically. Those are the, the uh, lines, the, f the, the lines in each of these plots. So this is the optical depth per wavelength varying over four orders of magnitude. And this is the resulting real and imaginary parts of, this, of the frequencies, so the damping rate and the dispersion uh, uh, phase velocity. And the, the different colors correspond to the ratio of radiation to gas pressure. So from very, very weak radiation to very, very strong radiation, where radiation completely dominates, that's the, the red curve. And then the, the stars are the numerically measured values. So we set up an exact eigenvalue for this wave on a periodic domain. We propagate it around the box 10 times. We then measure its phase velocity and damping rate, and then we have one point on this curve. And we do that for many different optical depths per wavelength and many different ra ratios of radiation to gas pressure. And you can see that we reproduce the dispersion relations extremely well. Uh, so our methods are indeed working in the linear regime. And we can even measure quantitatively what the errors are and show that our methods are convergent at, at least at first order, uh, and since it's an operator split method, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so we, we not only know we have accurate, but we can even measure the, the convergence rates. Those are linear solutions. What about nonlinear solutions? That gets to be very difficult now, and the only solutions I'm really aware of are for radiation dominated shocks. This is the case where you have a plasma moving in from the upstream direction supersonically. Now, you're probably used to a normal hydrodynamic shock where it goes through a discontinuous jump and then has a constant post-shock state. So, so you, you, the shock solution is just a true discontinuity, and you have an upstream and a downstream set of quantities that are related through the so-called ranking Huguenot jump conditions. Uh, but when you have radiation, then you greatly increase the complexity of shocks because photons can propagate upstream 
of the discontinuity, they can preheat the gas that changes the temperature and density upstream before it ever hits the shock wave. And certainly then it has to cool down in the post-shock region because if you're emitting photons that propagate upstream, they must be taking energy away from the post-shock flow. And so in a radiation-dominated shock, you get a much more complicated structure. So for example, this is a plot of the temperature, the radiation temperature theta and the gas temperature T for a particular Mach number for a radiation-dominated shock, showing you how you have this upstream precursor, this big spike, so-called Zeldovich spike, and then this cooling zone right behind the shock front, where then it settles into the post-shock flow. So how do you calculate this structure? Again, you can't do it analytically, but you can solve ordinary differential equations to compute this structure. Uh, that's a much easier problem than solving partial differential equations, so we, we trust the solutions that come from the ODE solvers. We then compare those directly that come from the, our code. We then set up this problem. We inject plasma supersonically. We study the shock front. We evolve it for many, many, many shock crusting times until it settles into a steady state. And then the, the crosses are the the solution from our code versus the dashed red line, which is the semi-analytic solution from solving the ordinary differential equations. And once again, we have excellent correspondence between the code solution and the analytic solution, including the Zeldovich spike, uh, the very, 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 very thin layer of cooling right behind the shockwave. So uh, we think that we're getting these solutions correct between these linear and nonlinear tests, but we're always looking for more test problems to be able to confirm that we're working. This is only for strong shocks, that's correct, that's correct. So you need, you need to have radiation fields in the post-shock flow, so temperatures where sigma t to the fourth is significant compared to just nkt, so they, they, it only for, for strong shocks, exactly, yep. So finally, in order to enable these calculations, you've got to run them on big computers because it's going to be expensive. And so being able to have not only good single core performance, but also very good scaling over many cores is important. And that was another reason for the rewrite into Athena++ and C++, is to try to optimize the code on modern architectures. So here's our weak scaling plots. It's the performance per, uh, per, per individual CPU. Uh, and measured in cells updated per second, which is a standard measure of performance for grid codes, uh, versus the number of, of uh, CPUs that we're using. And you can see that different lines correspond to whether it's hydrodynamics or MHD or the old version of Athena, which is the yellow lines, and the new version, the blue lines. So uh, the first thing you notice is this big drop from one to about 40 cores. That's because these are Intel processors with uh, up to 40 cores per CPU, and they all share the same memory bus, and so when you're maxing out the CPU performance, you're getting memory, bound, memory bandwidth limited. That was half the problem. The other half the problem is a feature that Intel doesn't tell you about, which is that if you actually run vectorizations on these ships, if you actually use the AVX instructions, then you can't have all 40 cores running AVX instructions. The CPU is unable to handle thermal load, and so it automatically dials down the, the clock speed uh, to, in order to give you better performance, so-called smart throttling. Anytime a vendor tells you anything is smart, you should be very worried about it. <laughs> and so it automatically loses 25% of its performance just because if you're using good vectorization, uh, the, the CPU can't actually handle that. So that's just built into the hardware. There's nothing we can do about that. But once you're on the full chip, then after that, our weak scaling is very, very good, nearly perfect. Uh, it's about 95% efficient on up to about uh, 40,000 cores on this particular machine. We also run on this so-called Knight's Landing architecture, where we do similarly well, up to f half a million processes, we're getting about 80, 85% efficiency. So these, these methods scale extremely well on modern, highly parallel systems, and they really enable you to do uh, very, very large calculations. I should also mention that you work very hard to get the performance better. It's about a factor of two better between Athena and Athena++, and it's, it's running at about two million zone cycles per second per core uh, for every calculation. So that's really quite enabling. So on a 10,000 cores, you're doing you know, many trillions of zone updates per second, which means you can do very, very large meshes. So let me turn to some of the results that we've gotten. And so let me give you a quick summary of what some of the other results have been found in, in the past. So we're not the first people to look at radiation-dominated flows in this, in this regime. I think the first paper we're aware of was by Turner et al., who used flux-limited diffusion, and one of those algorithms for radiation hydro that I mentioned, in local shearing boxes, like the movie I showed you earlier, the MRI. These were 3D stratified boxes 
looking at turbulent dissipation balanced by radiative cooling to look at the steady state structure of these accretion flows in, uh, in the local shearing frame. The, these flows were predicted to be thermally unstable, that a radiation dominated accretion disk back in the 1970s was predicted to be thermally unstable. They found them to be thermally stable in these calculations. Turns out we repeated this work with our uh, with our, our full transport method, in fact, found that they're, they're, they actually are thermally unstable. They do show thermal runaway, and the difference is because of using FLD, uh, this made a difference to this problem, as well as differences in the exa exact parameters of the calculations that we're doing. So we now know that radiation-dominated thin disks are thermally unstable and do show thermal runaways, uh, although the exact details of the instability are very different than what uh, Shakur and Sinai have predicted in, back in the 70s. Um, the, the most recent global simulations for black hole accretion flows, including radiation, uh, include work done by John McKinney and, and Oleg Sadowski uh, about five years ago using the so-called M1 closure. And here's an image from one of their calculations showing you the poloidal uh, flow and the equatorial slice. And uh, I'm sure there's no way you can possibly read these gra you know, axes, in the, probably even in the front row. But important is the uh, mass accretion rate, or sorry, the, um, sorry, this is the output energy divided by the Eddington luminosity. So it's in some sense an efficiency. And the, uh, this, this blue line here is what they measure from the, from the simulations. And they're getting uh, a ratio a little bit less than one, and a, a ratio an efficiency that's about a couple of percent. So they're, the, the amount of energy coming out uh, in photons is about a couple of percent of the energy going into the black hole from the accretion. And that's an important number to remember because we're going to try to look at that ourselves. And so we've done a whole new series of global simulations following on the work, for example, of McKinney and Sadowski. Uh, this was enabled by an allocation of computer time by the Department of Energy, uh, which, for which we're very, very grateful. They're uh, typically using 250,000 cores for each one of these calculations. They take 10 to 20 million CPU hours. We have a, a dynamic range of roughly three orders of magnitude in radius. Uh, we have uh, roughly uh, a billion grid cells with 100 angles in every single cell, and we're evolving these for several thousand orbital times in the inner part of the disk to let it settle down to in a steady state. And then we're trying to measure the properties of the steady state accretion flow, including radiation dynamics, for two systems, X-ray binaries, which I mentioned earlier, and AGN. And the difference between the two is the sources of opacity. In uh, X-ray binaries, the plasma is so hot, typically, one to 10 million degrees Kelvin, everything is completely ionized, and you only need to include electron scattering opacity. But in the supermassive black hole case, AGN, the disks are somewhat cooler, only maybe half a million degrees Kelvin, or maybe 300,000 degrees Kelvin. In that case, there's a few remaining iron ions left around. They have so many uh, spectral lines that they contribute significantly to the continuum opacity. This is the so-called iron opacity bump known to be very important in hot stars, for example. And so we've included that in the models of AGN. Uh, so unfortunately, radiation hydro breaks the dimensionality or the, the non-dimensionality of the problem, meaning you can't run one model for any mass black hole. You have to scale the models, in, you know, compute models individually for each black hole mass because opacity cannot be scaled dimensionlessly because the sources of opacity depend on temperature and that's a dimensional quantity and so just the way it is, it makes things much more complicated. So how do these calculations work? We, we start with a donut of plasma uh, in rotational equilibrium around the object. There's a weak magnetic field embedded in the donut. This makes it MRI unstable. The MRI will grow and produce turbulence, and then we follow that turbulence and the accretion that results from itself consistently. You see quickly the inner regions fill in. You can see the turbulence being generated throughout the domain as the MRI saturates. And now we evolve this now for many orbits, uh, at least a couple of orbits at the outer edge, in order to look at the steady state properties of the flow in the inner parts. We have no control over the mass accretion rate that's set self-consistently by the MHD. It's not a number that we enter into the code. It just happens. The only thing we can control is the initial surface density of the torus. By changing the total amount of mass in the torus, we can affect the total mass accretion rate. 
but not to an individual number. We can only just make it big or make it small by moving a lot of mass or a small amount of mass in the initial torus. Uh, the, the wire lines you see are the streamlines in the flow, and so you do see outflows coming from the pole, but it's completely dominated by the rotational motion generally uh, of the disk. And another way to, to look at this data is to plot the radial radiation flux, so the outgoing or the radial component of the radiation flux, with uh, outgoing labeled as blue and ingoing labeled as red, and this is an equatorial slice, and then a hemisphere, and this hemisphere will move slowly out through the domain to show you the structure of the radiation flux, and then it will open up like a pie so you can see inside. So you can see how the flow is largely contained to the midplane, that there's a large outward radiation flux towards the poles, where there's not so much material. Therein lies the solution to the superlington accretion problem. Most of the radiation comes out the poles, where there's not much material. You can see turbulence producing inward and outward fluxes of the radiation field at every radii. We're now at 300 RG, 300 times the black hole radius. Uh, open it up, and now you can see the poloidal structure and the turbulence as this evolves. Uh, as, this, as this bubbles and boils along, all driven by MRI turbulence. So what are the properties of these flows that emerge from, from these solutions? So first of all, we do get super Eddington accretion. If you measure the mass accretion rate divided by the Eddington value, where the Eddington value is defined by uh, an efficiency of 10%, it would be the energy released if 10% of the energy went into thermal photons, that's defined to be the Eddington ratio, or the standard value used for, for the mass accretion rate. So in this Eddington units, we're getting accretion rates that in the top panel, in the time average accretion is 150 times the Eddington rate. So the, the number at the end of the name is the uh, mass accretion rate in Eddington units. So everything from 150 in the top to 33 and so on. The differences between the models are the initial magnetic field geometry, or the initial density, and the, the surface density in the flow. So, first of all, you know, after a transient period, it, each model tends to settle into a steady state, uh, although, of course, there's a finite amount of mass, so if you run it for long enough, eventually this will die away again. Um, and, and that steady state accretion rate can be much, much higher than Eddington. You get super Eddington accretion flows. And one very important result that came from that uh, uh, accretion flow. And so, you know, let me highlight a few selected results. And here's one highlighted selected result. Uh, the role of turbulent transport of radiation energy in the disk. It plays a huge role in determining the global structure of the flow. So, uh, it's shown here in two ways, uh, or two, two sort of steps. First of all, there's an anti-correlation between density and magnetic energy fluctuations. So this is a turbulent flow, MHD-driven turbulence. Wherever the magnetic field is strong, that's a very strong magnetic pressure, and the, and the gas density there is a little bit lower on average. So where B squared is high, rho is small. And that shows up by plotting the correlation function between rho and B squared. The black is negative. You see negative correlations in the poloidal plane and the disk midplane. So density and magnetic energy fluctuations are anti-correlated. Why does that matter? Because these low density bubbles, magnetic bubbles in the flow, are buoyant. They want to rise out of the disk because they are slightly, they're under dense compared to the mean. And so that generates outward radial motion. And so there's a correlation between these density bubbles and their outward radial motion. And moreover, there's a correlation with the radiation energy density because these low density bubbles fill with radiation. They are a lower opacity. There's a higher radiation energy density inside the bubble. They're rising out and you can see that because there's a correlation between the outward VZ, radial velocity, and the radiation energy density. That's positively correlated in the volume. And so you have turbulence with the appropriate correlations that you have a net transport of energy by the turbulence outwards, a net advection of energy. It's just like convection, where the radial velocity fluctuations are correlated with the entropy fluctuations in such a way as to carry heat outwards. Same sort of things are happening with, through very different physical processes, but the same correlations are emerging. You're carrying heat out, and so this convective, uh, advective cooling is very important in cooling.
cutting down the disc and getting radiation out of the disc. And this is not included in the standard slim disc model, where people only consider radiative of radiation diffusion. And in fact, this radiation and convection is actually significantly larger than the rate of diffusion flux. So this is a very important result that in hindsight is sort of obvious, but in, in practice we weren't smart enough to think about all that. Of course, radiation-dominated disks should have a very large advective component to their heat flux, and it needs to be modeled incorporating the global model of the disk. So the other thing we've done is measure the efficiency, as I mentioned. So here's our different super Eddington simulations. The first column is their uh, mass accretion rate in Eddington units, as I mentioned. Uh, the second column is the radiative output in Eddington units, and you take the ratio between the two and it gives you an efficiency, and you can see it varies between about 1% and 7.4%. So the efficiency is very low the higher the Eddington ratio. So in such a way as to keep the ratio between radiation luminosity and Eddington about constant. No matter what M dot is, you sort of get about the same luminosity out, just because the efficiency seems to go down to the, when you go to these very, very high uh, uh, mass accretion rates. And these efficiencies are actually different than what uh, the M1 solutions were getting from Sadowski and all. And so that's a bit puzzling. Uh, there needs to be some more work in understanding uh, where those differences lie. Is it differences in our initial conditions, differences in our resolutions, or what? Uh, what's the difference? Because these numbers are very important for astrophysics, right? This is what's predicting the luminosity of the sources. Uh, and so we need to understand what these rate of efficiencies are very well. So we only have, you know, three models here, uh, and so we need to do a much larger parameter survey, really, to, to understand the, the, the range of possibilities, but we're at least off to a start in understanding that these efficiencies tend to be very, very low and go down as the M dot goes up. So that's sort of the general trend that's emerged immediately from these calculations. So, what about sub-Eddington accretion? I focused on the super-Eddington case, but you still get radiation-dominated flows even when the luminosity is, say, only 10% Eddington. Uh, and so, what about the physics in that, flow, in that regime? So, we've also done a bunch of models where we have lowered the initial surface density of the torus and given us mass accretion rates that are only 0.2 of Eddington in this case and 0.07 of Eddington in the, in the, in the case above. Uh, again, after some initial transient, it settles into a relatively steady state accretion flow uh, from which we can then diagnose the properties. What's very interesting is that we can measure the output luminosity as a function of time. So here it is between uh, you know, a factor of 10 to the 4 in light crossing times across the black hole. So that's roughly 10 to the 4 orbits at the inner edge of the disk. And so these are the actual light curves in the X-ray that you would measure for these sources. If you had an X-ray telescope and you were watching the inner part of the disk, this is the light curve you would, you would actually observe. And that's very exciting, in my opinion, to be able to now be able to connect directly between an, a, a theoretical calculation and what's actually observed. Many people have used the mass accretion rate as a proxy for the light curve. They've just assumed the instantaneous mass accretion rate gave you the instantaneous luminosity. And you can look at the two and you see that they're totally different. That approximation does not work. You really need to compute the Eddington or compute the radiation dynamics to get the light curve uh, because it does not follow directly from M dot. So, uh, and it's another advantage of including radiation in these models and other models is we'll be able to make direct connection to the data. So the, these sub-Eddington flows now are much thinner than the super Eddington. So here's a panel of four different models, time averaged and azimuthally averaged structure of the flow, the colors of the density for the 150 Eddington, 33 Eddington, 0.2 and 0.07 Eddington. As you see, as the mass accretion rate gets lower and lower and lower, the disk gets thinner and thinner and thinner. With adaptive mesh refinement, we still have many grid cells per vertical scale height here, still resolving the MRI in the disk midplane here, but it's geometrically much, much, much thinner than these uh, super Eddington flows. And the corresponding mass outflow rates and winds driven by the radiation field are also much, much lower. And remarkably, these disks are very thin, they're very strongly radiation pressure dominated, and yet we see no sign of thermal runaway. Remember I said that local shearing box calculations using full transport methods had shown thermal runaway exists in radiation dominated disks? They don't appear here. These disks and these global models don't show any sign of thermal runaway, even though we're using the same techniques that we used before to model them, so we should be able to capture it 
And I think the answer is because A, these disks have very strong magnetic fields in their midplane, and that helps support their thermal stability. And moreover, there's very strong radial fluxes, which are not included in local shearing box models. And these radial fluxes can, uh, can just eliminate the thermal instability. If was, some region tries to, to cool down and collapse, it just simply heats up by radiation from the neighboring, neighboring radii. And that's probably presenting these thermal runaways. And then uh, two more quick results. Another sort of surprising result is that actually radiation viscosity is extremely important in these sub-Eddington disks. So this is the, uh, this is the R phi component of various stresses in the flow. The Reynolds stress, that's the fluid dynamical stress due to velocity fluctuations. The Maxwell stress, that's the torque due to the magnetic field which drives accretion. And this is the R phi component of the radiation pressure tensor which you would associate with photon viscosity. Photons can scatter uh, transport angle momentum from one place to another, and uh, in a fully three-dimensional system, that includes off-diagonal terms. Uh, so if you're not in the diffusion limit and the radiation is anisotropic, you get radiation viscosity. And uh, so this is plots all scale to the gas pressure, and you see that in the midplane, it's all MRI. So for these very, very thin sub eddington disks, the accretion in the midplane is all being driven by MHD turbulence, as you might expect. But remarkably, above the disk, there's significant uh, transport due to radiation stress. There, it's optically thin. Photon mean free path is very large. Photons are scattering across a very large range of radii that's producing very large torques as a photon emitted in the inner region transports angular momentum and scatters off a photon or a particle farther away. And that actually produces an interesting coronal accretion flow due to radiation stress. Again, something we didn't expect, but emerges self-consistently in these sub-Eddington flows. It doesn't occur in the super-Eddington flows because they're so thick, there's nowhere where it's optically thin enough for the photons to contribute to the stress. And then finally, I mentioned these corona. Uh, again, in these sub-Eddington flows, 0.2 and 0.07, so this is now the temperature uh, in, the, in the plasma, averaged over time and azimuthal angle. You begin to see over a factor of 10 to 20 in radii, uh, a very, very hot plasma emerging above the, the, the midplane, above the photosphere. So you're generating temperatures that are orders of magnitude higher in the corona, in the, in the low density upper regions of the disk, than you are in the midplane. And why is that? It's simply because there's still turbulence and dissipation in the upper layers, but because it's optically thin, it can't radiate, it can't cool down. So whatever energy you're pumping in to the plasma due to dissipation of MRI turbulence, it just keeps heating the plasma up. It can't radiate it away. And it results in an extremely hot, uh, you know, large radius corona extending for, for, you know, a decade or more in radius. And again, we didn't put this in by hand, it's just emerging self-consistently when you have this very, very thin disk, turbulence above the midplane where the density is extremely low, it's above the photosphere, can't cool, it gets getting very, very, very hot. And it turns out that actually is pre presenting or resulting in these non-thermal spectra. So we take one of those models, we feed it into a Monte Carlo radiative transfer solver to compute the frequency dependent transport to compute a spectrum. Uh, and then we um, then pass that through the response function of detectors on, uh, using X spec and compare it to observed data. So here's New Star and XMM observations of a very particular ULX source, you know, with a phone number on top. And then the wiggly line is the observed data, and the red line goes through those points extremely well, and that's the, that's the spectra that emerges self-consistently with this green component coming from this very hot corona above the midplane, and the blue part being the central di disk, uh, which is more thermal. And so it's very encouraging that we get actually a remarkably good fit to the observed spectra for these sources without really doing much of anything except just post-processing the flow. There's really no free parameters in terms of being able to change the spectral shape it just comes self-consistently out of the density and temperature field that we get from the, from the simulation. So it's an encouraging step that maybe we're on the right track to understanding these corona, for example. There are still issues because uh, it doesn't work in all sources. I'm showing you sort of the best example. So I began my talk by uh, some observationally motivated questions. How does super Eddington increasing occur? It occurs because the flow is non-spherical, and most of the radiation is coming out the poles, and that allows the material at equatorial plane to accrete inwards at super Eddington rates. 
How do accretion disks corona form corona? It's from uh, dissipation of turbulence, but in dissipation in optically thin regions above the midplane where it can't cool down and gets very, very hot. And just the thermal heating from the turbulence alone is enough to create these apparently non-thermal spectrum, which are actually just the sum of many black bodies over a wide temperature range in the corona. Uh, and can we compute synthetic spectra and test con continuum and fitting models? Well, our first attempt at doing this is very encouraging, but we're still a long way from computing general spectra all the way out to the optical and UV. That's much, much farther out in the disk than the central regions we're considering, which is really only the X-rays. So, in order to compute a broadband spectra that includes UV optical, we're a long way to go. But at least we're on, I think, on the right track here. So, so let me summarize just to say that, you know, I think we're now in the era of doing full radiation hydrodynamics in three dimensions, incorporating radiation field as well as MHD. And that enables all sorts of new problems to be tackled in high energy astrophysics, as well as other fields where you know, radiative cooling, maybe momentum transport is not important by photons, but cooling can be, and these techniques can be used in those regimes as well. And I've talked about black hole accretion as one example, and I told you about the various results for super Eddington and sub Eddington disks. I won't go over all the results again, but that's just to say I, I think this is a start of an exciting era where now we can actually compare directly uh, theoretical calculations with observed light curves, spectra, and so on, and understand you know, the interaction of radiation matter for many, many astrophysical systems. And this one's sort of interesting because it's so extreme, but there's many more to come, I think. And I think you'll see a lot more work in this regime in the future. And with that, I think I'll, I'll close. So, thanks, Jim, for this fantastic talk about what we can learn about accretion disks around supermassive black holes and smaller objects yeah, yeah. Um, from really good and high precision and high physics numerical approaches. We already had some questions, but there must be more. Yes, I start with uh, Stefan Jordan. Yeah, very impressive talk. Uh, you. You, have, you told us that um, when you have not so high temperature, also iron is, uh, ions are yes. important. I guess that's an extreme NLTE uh, iron. Um, so how do you, uh, do you consider NLTE effects in, in the calculation of the spectra? I guess that would be extremely additionally expensive to the otherwise very expensive code. Exactly. So at the moment, we, of course, only include LTE, and we're using opacity tables that are being pre-computed for plasmas at these temperatures and typical solar abundances and so on. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's many circumstances where the plasma is probably non-LTE. So, for example, in the upper layers of the disk, where there might be a wind, it's probably going to be non-LTE, like a stellar atmosphere. Yeah. But incorporating that... Uh, it both scares me and, you know, excites me. Uh, I hope there's lots of young people here interested in following this because I think it's going to require their generation to figure this out. Um, so ideally in the future, yeah, it would be wonderful if we could incorporate a, a basic model for non-LT processes because what we've learned, I mean, I didn't show you the X-ray binary results, so the differences between the solutions with different opacities, but they're actually quite different. So opacity really matters. And therefore, probably in the future, getting the non-LT effects when they're important is going to be crucial for interpreting some, some flows. So much, much, much to be done down the road. Um, after reading the abstract of your talk, I was expecting a convection term in the radiative transfer equation, mm -hmm. but that wasn't there. It's, this is why I was asking for this N vector. Ah, right. So if, if you were... But, it, but you explained that sure, convection so, is important. Yeah, if you, if you, were, to, if you were to take the m uh, moments of the radiation transfer equation, uh, then you would see things like the convective terms appearing, because then you would be transporting energy density and flux mm -hmm. tied to the Eulerian mesh. But instead, we're just treating the radiation field as a specific intensity every grid point in space, the photons are not being, you know, they can scatter and, and uh, interact with the matter and therefore be transported in that sense. So, you know, the only interactions between the photons and the matter are captured in the source terms on the right-hand side. And that's where the convective parts come in. Uh, so so they're, not in, they're not in the transport. The only transport is 
Photons are emitted in one place and they travel somewhere else and then they get scattered again or absorbed and then they do the same thing all over again. And if they're in a moving medium, then the scattering process apparently moves along and then that represents next transport. But that's all buried in those scattering absorption turns when you're solving the equations in this form. So, Christian Fint. I have a very basic question. So you remove angular momentum from the inner disk by the MRI. So yes. where is that deposited? So the the outer disk should be supercapillarian, maybe at some That's stage. Right. Yeah. Is that so, true? So, yes, and absolutely right. I mean, the angular momentum is conserved. It's got to go somewhere. So these boxes are very large, three orders of magnitude. And I only showed you the inner 300 uh, gravitational radii. And the outer part, the, the, the outer edge of the torus is slowly moving outwards, uh -huh. you know, because angular momentum increases rapidly with distance. It only has to move a little bit to uh, you know, suck up all the angular momentum that comes in. I mean, it's a little more complicated because there is an outflow and a wind. So you know, a, a problem near and dear to your heart, there's a jet and there's magnetic torques and there's angular momentum fluxes carried away by that. Um, it's not, it's, these, these winds are not magnetically driven, so they're not sort of like protostellar jets. They're mostly radiation driven, but nonetheless, they still carry a little bit of angular momentum. So the overall angular momentum budget has many contributions, and one of them is slow uh, expansion of the outer part of the torus. So who's next? So maybe I can interject a question. I was wondering about non-ideal MHD effects. Do they play no role at all in these conditions? Or is there something to worry about, or more physics that needs to be included at some point? Uh, so I can, say, I can say yes and no. The, the, the no answer, non-ideal MHD, is not important. is because these things are sort of the poster child for fully ionized plasmas. Yes. These are million degrees Kelvin. You know, even, even iron is fully ionized. That's really hard. Sure. And so, so in principle, there are no neutral species left at all, and you shouldn't see any non-ideal effect, MHD effects. That's my no answer. My yes answer is, well, well, actually there's a radiation field which is strongly interacting with the electrons, but not the protons. And at these energy densities, you can begin to get weird uh, radiation uh, resistivity effects where the electrons uh -huh. begin to drift relative to the ions because of uh, radiation forces. And uh, that's, that's a whole ener high energy phenomena that we haven't tried to incorporate in here. So there may be some non-ideal MHD effects that are important in extremely uh, 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 extreme regions of parameter space in, in these flows, but we haven't tried to explore them at all. It's probably not important at all in the midplane of the disk where the optical depths are so large. The, the resistive scales would be very, very tiny. Okay. So, second question by Christian. It's another basic thing. You showed the system of equations you are solving. There was no equation of state. What is this kind of uh, incorporated? Or yeah, you you know radiation this. pressure and gas pressure? What right. So, so we, we, need, we need a closure relation for the gas pressure. Um, and that is just an ideal gas. Again, because it's fully ionized and it's non-relativistic, you know, it's not, not degenerate or anything like that. We don't, it's so an ideal gas law will work very, very well. So that's the simple line. And the beauty of solving the transfer equation directly is we don't need some closure relation for the radiation field. There's no radiation moments and we don't need a relationship between radiation pressure and energy density. I mean, that's what FLD is, that's what M1 is. But because we're solving the transport equation directly, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically the Boltzmann equation for photons, we, we know what the distribution function is. We know, you know, we can take its moments to compute the forces. And so, so that actually simplifies the problem in that you don't need to make some assumption, some arbitrary assumption about, about what the closure should be. And, and that's the great challenge of radiation hydro, is there is no closure that works for all flows and in all circumstances. Uh, just simply not true if it's optically thin. Okay, so next question, Ben, and please yep. forward. Oh, sure. So I'm curious with the major rewrite you did, mm -hmm. how much of adapting to new architectures was explicitly including things like AVX 512 instructions versus writing things in a way that automatic vectorization could work and you just stay out of the compiler's way. Right. 
Um, uh, very good question. And our philosophy is I don't want to have to embed SSC instructions. I don't want to embed machine code in my source code because uh, it's just way too hard and I don't have time. So if the compiler can't do it, then, I, then it's not going to work. So the key is to enable the compiler to auto-vectorize. And the key for that is to write data structures and loops that the compiler recognizes as being simple enough to, to vectorize. So that's what we spent our time, was figuring out what data structures would automatically vectorize easily uh, with the Intel compiler suite, and then adopt those for the entire code, rather than trying to embed explicit uh, SSC instructions or AVX instructions uh, function calls in the code. I mean, there are many people who do that and I admire them because they're way smarter than me being able to write code like that. So, <laughs> Thanks. I'm just wondering, you put the full GR in the uh, much more work to be done. Do you have any clue what would happen for like a spinning black hole instead of like a non-spinning one? So, say that again? The, if you assume that the central black hole is spinning. Uh, right, so that requires, as you say, putting in the GR. Uh, and there will be a big difference between, so, so there's been a huge amount of work in studying black hole accretion flows without radiation, uh, and especially focusing on the production of jets. Uh, and there it's been discovered that uh, you certainly need a spinning black hole to produce relativistic jets, and moreover you need net magnetic flux on the horizon so that you, you get the, you know, the spinning magnetic field lines which then drive pointing flux and a relativistic jet beam. So you need those two things to get relativistic jets produced. Uh, uh, of course, that doesn't appear here because we were not doing the full GR. We now have a full GR version of the radiation transport. Uh, it's much more complicated because that little n dot grad i term is now following photons along geodesics, which are no longer straight lines, they're curved. But uh, it took us a little while, but we figured it out, and we can do geodesics and curve space-time. So one of the next projects is to repeat this with spinning black holes in the middle to look at the formation of jets and to understand the interaction of the radiation field with these relativistic beams that you're generating. Because, for example, you can get radiation drag. You know, you might think radiation accelerates f outflows, but in fact, you're already accelerating the stuff to relativistic speeds through MHD, and then that's going faster. In, in that sense, the photons are actually a background medium that produces drag and slows you down. You're trying to move through this very dense radiation field, and, and it, that slows you down because of the Doppler shifting. And so we want to understand how much that affects the, the production of collimated jets in these. So the, um, yeah, we're looking forward to doing the full, full GR calculations uh, in the next couple of months, actually. So maybe I had <laughs> a second question. In the, I think one of your last slides where you have shown the, um, no, one, one further. There were stripes, radial stripes here, and this one on the right hand side. Why are there radial stripes for in, the, in the red? In the red. So, or black. remember as we get towards the poles, our resolution is extremely low. Yes. And moreover, this region is uh, extremely low density because of the angular momentum barrier that prevents material from getting to the poles. So I would be cautious about interpreting the uh, temperature there. Uh, optical depth is extremely small. There's almost no material there. So it basically doesn't contribute to the radiation field in any way. So even when you include it in a spectrum, it doesn't generate anything. It's this stuff over here, which is resolved in the mesh that I, I would believe, and that stuff is what's producing, you know, the... Now, the other thing is, you know, this other feature here, I, I don't know, I mean, remember this is some time average, and so maybe, maybe it's the particular orbit we chose. If we did another 10 orbits, would it be the same? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I don't put much stock in the small scale structure here, but rather just the emergence of this corona, which doesn't go away no matter what snapshots we look okay, at. Okay, so it could be a little blob that just... Could be filaments. You know, I mean, okay. one, one really important thing to realize when you look at this data is if you, if you plot the photosphere, it's not a smooth surface. This is turbulence with large uh, amplitude density fluctuations. It's Swiss cheese okay. with uh, blobs of optically thick plasma that are well above the photosphere mm -hmm. and holes that go deep into the photosphere. And in a very time-evolving way, this, every snapshot looks slightly different. And so. So yeah, there could just be blobs that were, for some reason, a little bit higher and lower, and, and you know, it makes simple 
simple spectral modeling kind of hard because the, it's actually very, very complex geometrically. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. So, I see no more urgent questions. Um, before we thank Jim for this beautiful talk, let me make two announcements. Um, A, we go for the conference, not conference, for the uh, colloquium dinner uh, now after this. And it would be good to get a quick hands up who would be interested in joining us. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I think the idea is to go to Red at the Altes Hallenbad, but we can discuss it. So I would say just let's meet here and uh, discuss how we do that. We will first start with drinks and then we slowly give, get into the food part. Um, the second thing is I would like to announce uh, next week's talk. Um, we, are, we are going to slightly larger scale, so Ellis from Durham University will talk about galactic halo renaissance and the idea is also to compare high precision cosmological galaxy formation simulations with high precision observations of these type of objects. So please come again, it's going to be a very interesting talk by Alice. So with that, let us thank Jim again for this fantastic talk.